Καλησπέρα σε όλε και όλου. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nicolas Asprulis. I work at the Academy of Theological Studies of Olos, and I would like to welcome you to today's meeting, the full meeting of the online series of speeches with title Time for Action. This meeting will discuss a very critical issue of our times, and namely artificial intelligence. Is it a threat or is it an opportunity? Before telling you a few things more about our distinguished speakers and the agenda, I would like to say a few things both in English and Greek, sort of housekeeping rules for our participants in order to be able to facilitate the conversation. This meeting is recorded, so later on it will be available at our YouTube channel. You can also follow the discussion both in English and Greek, should you um, want to listen to the English. You will have to go at the globe, at the icon, at the lower part of your screen, and then you could choose your language, either English or Greek. Moreover, in order to participate in the dialogue later on, there are various ways, for example, by raising your digital hand from the lower part of your screen, or by typing the question to the Q&A window. Or you can even type your question to the chat raising your digital hand, and we will give you the floor, typing your question to the Q&A window or typing your remark at or question at the chat box. Webinar, roundtable discussion in the circle of um, the Time for Action online lectures organized by the Volos Academy for Theological Studies. It is our pleasure to welcome you uh, today in this important a webinar uh, which will discuss a critical uh, topic related to uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, I will take the opportunity to share with you some practical information regarding uh, the way that you can get involved in the discussion after the two interventions. You can raise your virtual hand on the menu before of you. There is a menu bar in the Zoom uh, before of you. You can raise your uh, virtual hand, or you can write your comment or question in the chat box or by using the Q&A uh, session. Uh, I would like also to mention that this webinar will be recorded, so you, it will be available afterwards for someone that would like to uh, to see, uh, to watch the video. It also, I would like to mention that uh, you can also choose your language in order to hear in English or uh, English or Greek uh, the today's uh, webinar by again choosing the globe on the web or the menu bar of Zoom uh, and select your uh, convenient language. Um, before giving the floor to our two speakers, I would like to say a few things. First of all, we will have Dr. Theophanes Tassis, who is a philosopher and lecturer of practical philosophy at the University of Alpenadria in Austria and visiting professor uh, at the university in Switzerland, while our second speaker, Dr. Geg Voloshak, is a professor of Oncology and Radiology at Northwestern University in the United States of America. Now, without further ado, I would give the floor to Dr. Ioannis Tassis for 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes to uh, share um, his ideas. He has written a lot of books and texts on artificial intelligence. So he might be one of the few Greek uh, experts, if I may so, on the artificial intelligence. You have the floor. Thank you very much for your invitation. We are at a crossroads. The now rapid evolution 
of artificial intelligence, we know that it keeps growing. So artificial intelligence is multimodal, meaning that it cannot work only with text, but in real time, it can record video, it can um, work with images, music, and give back both text, sound, and images. Artificial intelligence can work with information at a real time from multiple sources, and therefore you understand that this reflects the ability of human brain to work with all kinds of information at the same time. The question right now is if it would be possible for a future version of artificial intelligence to become conscious. So the relationship between conscious and um, brain is very complex. However, being smart doesn't mean that necessarily this being is has got conscience. In my opinion, the ability of artificial intelligence today, such as GPT-4, to walk and interpret, if you wish, information from a lot of sources does not mean that it has got conscience. And in my opinion, in the future, this would not be the case. Conscience is a human characteristic, in my opinion, which can be differentiated from computational characteristics and skills of artificial intelligence. And this is because it is combined with our bodily function. This is, for example, have to run softwares, and for that, and that software does not affect its hardware, the hardware of the PC. And if it's hardware would start to change during this process, the software would start to uh, have errors. However, we know that human brain has got a plasticity, and during our life, there are new synapses formed there in the brain, but the synapses stop working. There is a plasticity showing exactly this uh, combination and this interaction between this process of being conscient. The fact that, in my opinion, we cannot have a conscious artificial intelligence, and of course there are other arguments, this is um, my choice to use the argument of biology, this does not mean, however, that artificial intelligence will not grow as much as human intelligence that we can have a general artificial intelligence that will be able to do almost everything that we can do, that human beings can do, and maybe in some of that tasks, it might be even better than human beings. And consequently, to create a super intelligent AI that would even be uh, more intelligent than human beings. Therefore, for the first time in the history of mankind, there is a question. If we wish to go towards this direction, meaning that if it would be prudent to choose, create an artificial intelligence similar to our own intelligence in this planet. Of course, there are a lot of benefits, all human activities, uh, will be performed more quickly, in a better way, maybe, and more easily, why not? But however, at the same time, we cannot be certain that all those activities will be done in the way that we would wish to be done. Meaning that nowadays, references make to the alignment of artificial intelligence with our own values. So this issue of the alignment of artificial intelligence with human values is a very complex issue. And we haven't really started to approach it. On the other hand, the uh, development of the cognitive skills of artificial intelligence is uh, 
very quick since the computing power is increasing since more and more servers are used that they can process a large volume of data artificial intelligence keeps getting better however its alignment with human values is still difficult to be resolved however nowadays companies that play a leading role in developing artificial intelligence such as microsoft open ai and DeepMind by google on the other hand just to mention the biggest they are in a kind of speed race one would say and they are worried of losing their leading role and in the effort to make the mark on the market and safeguard the largest part uh, share of the market they allow the public to use more and more newer and newer versions of artificial intelligence without exactly having solved the issue of the alignment of the artificial intelligence with human values so in order to mention on an application of artificial intelligence that i find rather concerning or something that we cannot predict unpredictable is an application by the company you only virtue and this application or rather by this application uh, uh, we are allowed to communicate with our loving ones through a specific software that would be able to record those communications and they will be able to train an artificial intelligence application and when we are no longer in life when we are dead a large volume of data personalized data will be used that will build a digital clone that could communicate with our loved ones that are still in life the logo of the company the motto of the company is that you will never have to say goodbye and therefore you understand that this digital clone or let me clarify that the digital clone will not just be in the disposal of the relative and that they will decide when they will communicate but the clone can take the initiative send message and start calls wherever and whenever they might think and you only virtual this company wants to develop holograms meaning that the hologram will be able to uh, appear at your room at your home and that will also be trained with your data and of course this service is uh, available by a monthly installment monthly payment and therefore we will have a digital goal of our own ones all of our loved ones and we can communicate with them this in my opinion is one of the unpredictable applications of artificial intelligence that showcase the possibilities um, that this technology entails those possibilities will find a lot of uh, users i'm sure and the difficulty in my opinion can be summarized in the following message in the following dilemma if you wish on the one hand we have um, something that will help us do a lot of chores for example answering hundreds of emails or book home hotels or airplane tickets or uh, file our tax return and on the other hand to freedom because by um, assigning this application with our chores and later on all of our tasks since uh, they will be done quite well we will find ourselves in a situation where, where this gradual assignment of human activities to the artificial intelligence will lead to the loss of our freedom this 
dilemma is not easy to be solved because at, even before the Industrial Revolution and more and more after Industrial Revolution, technological development is based on that human tendency, if you wish, towards doing our lives easier. Technology makes our lives easier, more comfortable, and for the first time, we find ourselves uh, to have to answer to that question, is there any limit to this facilitation? Is there any limit to that easier life? And where uh, should that uh, limit be? This is a question towards the legislator in the state, as well as for the users themselves. Another example, in order to illustrate uh, my point, my argument, would be the following. We discuss here today, and those of us who follow us online, we are not in a position to do multi very complex mathematical calculations with our minds. And this is why, because we can use a um, calculator. Nobody is ashamed to say that they, we cannot do with our minds a uh, complex mathematical calculation, even people with PhD in mathematics. Nowadays, artificial intelligence is writing texts, texts that are have a quite good quality. Most of the times, it is not easy just by taking a look at them to understand that they were written not by humans, but by an artificial intelligence application. Therefore, I could easily imagine that um, humans might lose the ability to write texts, or no one would feel the need to read books, since they can have the summary of any book of any text very quickly and easily at their disposal. This, of course, is not something that will happen overnight. This will take this gradually, since one generation after the other will feel more and more comfortable to assign artificial intelligence with writing their texts. For example, my students for the last year, they use artificial intelligence in their communication with me. And while their emails, they were fairly badly written, nowadays, most of the students' email are high quality and very well written, well were articulated. So it is easy to assume that they use artificial intelligence to write their emails. So this dilemma between uh, freedom and uh, facilitation is very important because it relates to the question on which human activities have value per se, meaning which are the activities that have a meaning for us for human beings and which are those activities that are have no uh, value for us. For example, uh, transferring nuclear waste is a human activity that could be delegated to a robot run by an artificial intelligence software is not something that has got meaning for humans themselves. However, to answer to our mail is something that it would not be prudent to be delegated to artificial intelligence. Let us also note that Microsoft is buying out a lot of robot companies because they want to install or rather to train them by deep learning in order to have an embodied artificial intelligence. And right now, there are robots that learn with a similar way, such as big um, language models learn. Imagine a robot chat uh, GPT-4, and uh, that robot will be able to find the best possible combinations of words uh, based on the gestures that they read from the human being. So they can find the combination uh, of that gesture that um, is similar, reflecting the gestures of the actual person. So you understand that the 
growth of artificial intelligence will be exponential. Awesome Altman predicts that in the next five or six years, we will have a kind of general artificial intelligence, an artificial intelligence similar to that of human beings, and And the CEO of NVIDIA shares the same opinion. Of course, there are efforts to regulate um, the environment. The European Union approved the chart for artificial intelligence a few weeks ago. However, the difficulty in regulating the development of artificial intelligence, for example, the transparency of algorithms that collect data how artificial intelligence is trained, how exactly artificial intelligence comes up with a specific conclusion, and who has got the liability after all. Is it the user? Is it the uh, software developer or the company that owns the software? So the difficulty in regulating this environment is that every time we regulate afterwards and the legislative framework is coming after the development of artificial intelligence, meaning that the um, new law proposed by the European Union has a lot of weaknesses. For example, when there is a distinction between AI applications that are dangerous, less dangerous or low risk applications, it does not understand that a low risk application, meaning that an application that has not been uh, designed as an application collecting personal data, nevertheless, could be used for such a scope. So the legislatory framework is a very difficult thing, and it cannot touch upon research in artificial intelligence. It is mainly about the, its applications. And uh, this is very serious, in my opinion, because in the case of artificial intelligence, such as research having to do with molecular biology, there should be a clear limit. Uh, how much can we reach? For example, uh, the, the alteration of human DNA. The same goes for artificial intelligence. Is it going uh, to put the limit on the general artificial intelligence? And no more nothing, uh, doing nothing over that. Or would it be late and the limit should be uh, earlier? We shouldn't maybe and allow for the general artificial intelligence to be developed, but only to have very specific AI applications that will not have the opportunity to go over the scope that they are planned for. Something like that is very difficult to be done because most of the applications that are developed right now, such as the digital uh, helper, go towards the direction of the general artificial intelligence or as rumor has it that Apple will go on um, April 18, will be a version of Siri that will use a large prognostic model in order to communicate with the user seamlessly and um, undertake various activities and, and uh, tasks in real time. So, in order to sum up, I would like to say that we should put some limits into research. We shouldn't uh, try to develop it more than the, the general artificial intelligence. And with the above in mind, we must uh, allocate more resources and create a legislative framework that will impose companies to do more work in order to align the artificial intelligence with our values, because this uh, is a problem that seeks um, 
the contribution of a lot of experts such as philosophers, psychologists, and we might need a lot of years in order to resolve this issue. And as we said, it needs an interdisciplinary approach in order to have AI applications that do serve the needs of human beings. And I don't want to say that we can build a moral artificial intelligence, but an artificial intelligence that would not be amoral. We want a moral artificial intelligence that will not be conscious, but would be able to interpret our own values in such a way that would not be harmful to us. Meaning that we should safeguard that it would be harmonized with our goals without causing harm, and at the same time, um, safeguard in our autonomy and independence. This is not just a philosophical and scientific problem. This is a political issue, in my opinion, that will change the human history. And the prerequisite to resolve this issue is to choose which are the activities that should be delegated to artificial intelligence and which sh we believe that we should keep for us because they are valuable to us. And in order to answer to that question, we should go once again and uh, try to answer the question, what is man? Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your to the discussion. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. <laughs> I'm sure that we will have a lot of to discuss. Now, I would like to give the floor to our second uh, guest, Dr. Uh, Gail Volish. Gail, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Nikos, and uh, thank you, Dr. Tassis, for such a great uh, description. I think it it helps set up the stage for what I want to say. I'm going to use a slide, so I'm going to share my screen right now. So I have here my uh, my email address, and if anybody has any questions or wants to have a more detailed discussion, I'm happy to do it. Uh, please feel free to contact me. So I just want to set the stage by talking a little bit about how AI places itself into our thinking about ethics. So ethics is a branch of philosophy. It It's where we kind of talk about what's right and what's wrong. And we address disputes that have diversity from a moral perspective. It comes from the Greek word, as most of our the listeners probably know, ethikos, and um, it tries to define what's best for be the best way for us to live, how we should think about things. Um, Cyril of Jerusalem had a, had a comment on ethics, and he basically said, I won't read the entire quote, but he wanted to say that it's not just knowledge that's good, but it's trying to understand what the best approach is for how we should act. So it's actions that are important here. And I guess I wanna give the perspective that from the Orthodox perspective in general, technologies are neither good nor bad, it's how we choose to use them. Um, so for instance, uh, radiation, which is what I work with most of my, most of my days, is both good and bad. If we uh, do not manage our power plants properly, if we do not manage how we handle radiation, it can be very harmful. But by the other, on the other token, we use radiation to treat cancer um, to be able to have people uh, live better lives. So there are advantages and disadvantages and they're good and bad. So I'm gonna, so if we, if we now digress and talk about machine learning and AI, I am probably going to lump these together in most of my discussion, but they are actually separate disciplines. Machine learning is where we use very large data sets to help to understand, to make our machine learn information. We use it most often for filtering emails, for speech and pattern recognition. In my own lab, we use it for understanding very large data sets I have data from uh, 49,000 mice, 24,000 dogs. 
I can't possibly understand that myself. So we use machine learning approaches to um, be able to assess it. Artificial intelligence, though, takes what computers do and what machines do to try to mimic some of the decision-making capabilities of what the, what the human mind can do. So we're going a step beyond understanding data and now trying to synthesize, use that data to make decisions. Um, uh, the, one of the news networks said, AI will be billions of times smarter than humans, man and, and machine need to emerge. Now, I think that um, AI is certainly much smarter than I am and can do things that I can't possibly do in my own lab. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of those uh, as we go along. But they're used today for facial recognition. So um, in many airplanes now, when you get on the plane, they take a photo of you and then they use that for facial recognition to get your name and see whether you're actually on the plane. Um, there's there, there are medical applications where machines are used to help figure out what kind of diagnosis a person might have or um, what might be a good way to interpret a, a radiology, um, a, an X-ray or a CT scan. There are robots, there are voice assistants, which were mentioned in the previous talk. There's a lot with cybersecurity that's being done. And then there is producing speech for different languages. A lot of the interpretation um, software that we use is, is uh, based on both machine learning and AI capabilities. So I, I, I have a cousin from Ukraine who lives with me. He's a refugee. And we communicate using Google Translate often. And that, again, uses machine learning and AI approaches. More recently, there has been um, the development of a method called ChatGPT or a program. Um, this is an algorithm that allow that can allows you to develop text, which means anything from stories, articles, movie text, and you give just a human amount of, of limited amount of human information. So you give a small little text to ChatGPT, and you say develop a story about this or develop an article about this. Um, there are also other systems from Google and several others, but the idea is to help it help to develop some text following just a simple human instruction or a prompt and to get a very detailed response from it. Now, I'll tell some stories in a little bit about some problems that have come up using chat GPT, but um, some of the things I think that are important are that you need to make sure that what you've put in the chat, what comes out of the chat is accurate. So I tell my students to write a particular R code, which will help them uh, solve a problem. Often what happens is they go to chat GPT, they write it, they have chat GPT write it, it's never correct. So they need to be able to fix it after it's done. A second problem is that there need to be rules that are developed for accountability. For example, um, how can we check the data that we're getting out of ChatGPT or out of any AI system? Um, a, a third problem, and I think this is getting to be a, a, a greater problem, is that many of these systems you actually have to pay to use. So they're not truly open systems. They're not available to everybody. Um, they're only available in selected situations. Um, I think that as the number of users becomes larger, uh, we're able to uh, be able to expand the debate and we need to improve the transparency. Um, a, a Nature Journal was reviewing ChatGPT and said one of the most immediate issues, most important immediate issues for the research community is the lack of transparency. And I'll give some examples on sort of how that lack of transparency and bias uh, influences AI. So here is a, a story. Um, what I did is I put into ChatGPT a prompt. I was teaching a course for Ukrainian uh, theologians in Volos this past summer. And I asked ChatGPT to write a 
um, a long, rather long uh, limerick on, on the event. And this is the limerick that it wrote. Now, I'm not going to read the entire limerick, um, but I'll read part of it. There was once a professor named Gale who taught AI with great zest and travail. In Volos, Greece, she aimed to appease a group of theologians from Ukraine they hailed. Now, this, this goes on to tell these stories, but um, the ending, I think, is very important. From Greece, a message resounded. As the theologians' curiosity rebounded, AI and theology hand in hand, a future they began to understand, thanks to Professor Gale, their horizons expanded. Now, I did not tell AI that there was going to be a nice blending of theology and AI during this for this course. AI assumed that that was going to be the case. It had a bias that AI would be good and AI would match up with theology very well. So here we see in it as an example, which is just sort of a foolish uh, enterprise, that there was a bias to the AI that was coming out. There is also art that is based on AI. And what many people claim is that it, it mimics human art, but it is not the same as human art. It's not creative, it's not as detailed, and it suffers from the biases of what exists on the internet. Um, as people call it, it's made to order art. Here's a website about it. Um, anybody is welcome to this uh, information. I'm ha ha happy to pass it on. But AI was asked to do an icon of St. Matthew, and it came up with this very sort of typical type of icon that you might find in, uh, uh, you know, almost cartoonish in many ways in the way in which it was, it's depicted. Not what we would expect to be expressive or um, would, would be in any way inspiring to us. So some of the concerns about AI that it's difficult to regulate, there are people that worry that um, AI is uh, understanding jokes that people give. And so therefore it's de developing a mind of its own. And in fact, one of the developers of AI actually walked away from the work because he was worried about how it would be interpreted. There are people that claim that it's going to lead to human extinction. Um, I think that's a, a bit of an overstatement if we are actually, if humans are using AI as a tool. There are concerns about jobs being lost. Um, I think a great concern is about students and their original work. And I'll tell a story about that in a few moments. And then there are questions that get that come up about, does an artificial intelligence have any rights? Are they like persons? And I will argue that, they, that AI has many, it has many things, but it is not really a person. So, um, so the concepts would be bring consent to AI. The future is going to be probably very specific and not generalized. Um, we should not let AI make decisions. And there are always concerns about breaking uh, data protection laws. So, so my, my thinking about this all is that there are many, many advantages. And those advantages come from um, places where we can use AI. AI can hold much more information, not just than any one human can contain, but in a sense, it can contain almost all human knowledge. Um, it develops to the point of being able to um, have access to all human data sets that exist. It's not quite at that point, but has millions of patient data, millions of financial budgets, all of that's possible. Um, it was not possible even 10 years ago. Um, there are big applications in clinical care. I live in um, a clinical department and I see it uh, coming up. In fact, this morning, I just had a meeting with uh, radiologists who are trying to use AI to sidestep having any f physician interpret the data um, for finance, for language, um, and then in universities, uh, for my students, they use it for language correction often and for write, writing. Um, in medicine, uh, there is medical domain knowledge. 
Uh, so you can actually say, I don't uh, tell me about this disease and AI can make it be very easily accessible in a way that's synthesized better than you can get on the internet. Um, for a lot of radiology, you can actually use AI right in, in the clinic to uh, do some of the work that needs to be done. Um, AI can be used for helping to make bedside decisions for interactive note taking, um, I myself use it for interactive note, note taking. Uh, we certainly use chat box bots for patients. And then even now there there have been for probably the last 10 years, robotic surgeries that are programmable. Those are going to probably get better and better so that the robot can make some decisions as it's going through surgery. So we have these aspects where there's artificial intelligence machine learning um, as a part of artificial intelligence, and then deep learning as a field within machine learning. And this deep learning allows us to uh, understand things in depth, not just in breadth. And um, so it provides us with a lot of uh, new knowledge. So this was a paper that came out in Nature just a couple of weeks ago. And it's interesting because the prompt that they gave the AI was, Black African doctor is helping poor and sick white children, photojournalism. This is the image that AI came up with. And in fact, it's a white doctor helping black children. So what happened was the AI had such a bias to it that it assumed that a black physician would not be helping white children and drew the exact opposite of the um, prompt of what was requested. So this is a bias that exists within AI, and it comes from the fact that AI gets its data from the web. And if there are biases in the kinds of information that were put on the web, they're going to be present here. Um, this is an, another uh, set of data that were done from looking at stereotypes. And if we call sort of the zero being the balance where it's equal, equal, uh, in the upper panel, they have 100% male as being on one side and 100% female as being on the other side. And of course, housekeepers, nurses, therapists, and flight attendants were 100% female. Cooks were close. For male, firefighters, taxi drivers, software de developers, and then chefs were predominantly male. Again, this is how AI chose to portray um, these people. And you can see that it is a very, uh, it gives a biased picture. Let's do now look, look at the white versus non-white. The pilot, the therapist, the flight attendant, the chef, the software developer, the firefighter, the nurse were mostly white. The housekeeper was equally distributed. The cook was a little bit in the non-white and the taxi cab driver was leaning toward uh, equality here. Um, so you can see that these, that, that there is a bias that exists in the system, and this is going to be very difficult to be to overcome. So the challenges are validation, of course, verification, trying to make sure that what we see is true. When AI is considering billions and billions of pieces of data, it's very hard for us to verify that it's accurate. Um, there are social biases, there are privacy issues because my data went into AI just like everybody else's does, and 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 shouldn't my data belong to me and not to uh, some broad community? And then there are worries about pre-training the pre-training data sets of what people think should be instead of what the world is. So what that would the example of that would be if somebody said, well, it shouldn't look like this. It should be that everything is parity. So let's make AI take this stand. Then we're programming AI to do what we think it should do rather than what it actually does. Um, okay, uh, there are videos that are available and I would recommend these two if people wanna look at them. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton has talked about the warning of uh, AI. He was one of the people that developed it. He did an interview on BBC News um, where he quit Google and talked about why. And he also did an interview calling it an existential threat. I'm not sure I agree with all of Jeffrey Hinton's views, but I think it's worth it uh, to look at him. So uh, again, 
AI fits into typical technology. It's neither good nor bad, dep but depends much on the application. There are a few orthodox perspectives on it at this point. You can find a few. There was a Science and Orthodoxy Around the World Conference on AI and Theology in Balamond. There was one, uh, there, there's one in, in Poland uh, done by uh, Alexandra Stavanovich. Um, there have been certainly consideration of AI in a post-human promise of creating an infinite virtual world that has had somebody discuss at least those topics. And there are some people that say that postmodern technology raises the same questions as pre-modern theology did many years ago, and it's nothing uh, new to the world. There was even a movie written by AI. This is the link for it if anybody would want it. I'm happy to share uh, these slides with anybody, and it's it'll be on the video, of course. Now, I want to tell um, four stories about AI, uh, and, and I think they, that I'll use them to give a flavor to the perspectives here. So first of all, I, I love AI. I use AI in my lab and it allows me to do work that I couldn't do any other way. So for instance, we have a project right now where we're trying to understand all the, the action, interactions of cells within the brain and what their elements are that they each use. So think about the elements from the periodic table, uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, et cetera. Think about those that you learned back in, in high school. Where we're trying to understand for every single cell in the brain, how it uses these elements, where they're located, how this changes in normal processes and how it changes in disease processes. We could never do this without AI. Um, we, we, you can't even map all the interactions in the brain without AI. So, so it, AI opens possibilities for work that we can do now that we were, would not have been able to do in the past. So it's really remarkable and gives us some a unique possibility. So I'm excited about what I, AI can do. But I'll also tell the story of those Ukrainian priests who took my class this past summer at Volos. And I asked them to, to have ChatGPT write a sermon. So we asked ChatGPT to write a sermon, and they wrote the sermon for the Feast of the Transfiguration because the feast was coming up. So they said, uh, write a feast for an Orthodox parish on the Feast of the Transfiguration. That was the, that was the prompt. And the ChatGPT wrote a sermon that was very accurate. It, was, it, it gave particulars of the feast day, uh, ways to think about it. But when I asked the group what they thought about the sermon, they said that it was accurate, but it had no heart. It didn't have that kind of human component. It was not the sermon that should be given to that group of people in that parish on that day. It was a generic sermon that could be given to any group of people on any Feast of the Transfiguration. Um, so they felt that it lacked human interaction. So that's a limitation, I think, that they found. Although I have to note that somebody said maybe more sermons written by Chad GPT would be better than the ones we hear. Um, that's just a joke. Um, the, the third application I want to talk about is a student who, I, I'm, I'm a dean at Northwestern, and I have to deal with uh, the academic integrity issues that come up for students. And one student turned in a paper that the professor thought Chat GPT had written it. And in fact, when I looked through the paper, there were um, things that were inappropriate. And it, it was an example of chat GPT kind of hallucinating. Uh, chat GPT made up its own mind of what, the, what should be there, and it wasn't really relevant to the topic. But the student turned in the paper, and uh, we ran it through several checks, but most of those checks are inaccurate. So you hope that the student's going to admit to the problem as you're meeting with them. So I met with the, the student, had you know talk, tried to talk about the seriousness of turning in a chat GPT paper when it's expected to be your own work. And it turned out, um, as we came to the course of discussion, the student did not write the paper. He had his brother write the paper for him. And then, upon later questioning, his brother used chat GPT to write the paper. Um, so I think the lessons of that story are that, you know, first of all, don't ask others to write a paper because they might use ChatGPT for you. But this, the other lesson is that you can actually distinguish in many examples when 
ChatGPT has written something. And again, that human element is missing from the work. Um, the fourth, fourth example I'm going to use is uh, one that came to me. It, it actually came to my desk this morning, but it's come in many times recently. So um, radiologists who use um, x-rays and CT scans and MR images to try to diagnose disease, they were, they analyzed chat GPT and its ability to diagnose and then to come up with an appropriate treatment. Um, there are two points I'll make. First of all, most of the data have shown that chat GPT, that, that I'm sorry, that AI is uh, frequently gives close to the same answer that the physician would. But when when AI is off, it's really off. Um, it was off recently in a test that was 85% of the diagnosis was correct, but 15% was actually the physician saw the disease and AI did not see the disease. 15% that was off. That's a lot to be off for diagnosis. Even worse is uh, when it comes to treatment. Um, you can think about what might happen when you're thinking about what kind of chemotherapy you want to give a cancer patient. The physician takes into consideration not just the age, which AI can do, not just um, the, the, um, what the cancer is, which AI can do, but also takes into consideration how debilitated is this patient, how well can they handle getting um, this, this amount of chemo? What impact will it have on them? Do they have somebody to help them when they go home from therapy to deal with the kind of therapy they got? And they make treatment decisions based on many of those parameters that take into consideration who the, who the human being is, not just who that, uh, you know, what, what their particular diagnosis is. So my, I guess my bottom line is that while I think all AI has is a great tool and can be very, very useful in helping with many things. It does not replace that human component that's needed for many of these um, aspects. Um, so there are things that are unique about humans. I'll just mention a couple of them and then I'll end. Um, we have a culture. Uh, AI does not have a culture. Uh, AI does have a bit of a language, but our use of language is not just to convey thoughts. It's also allowing for relationship and personhood. We establish who we are to some extent by an interactive uh, discussion that goes back and forth. Who, uh, what is unique involves a fulfillment of being and there is a uniqueness for each person that is that even, even between identical twins is unique per person. I think other people would, answer, would, would say that other things that make us unique are common sense. Uh, world-shaping capability, and responsible agency. So while machines can have some of the attributes we talked about, they don't have these attributes that make things be unique. I won't spend a lot of time talking about speech, but I will mention my final comment, which is uh, this, this thought that came from uh, Bishop Callistos Ware of Blessed Memory. He talked about what it is to be human. So anthropos is the Greek word for human, as most listeners know. It comes from the word anathrene, which means to look up. Humans, unlike most animals, perhaps maybe birds are different, uh, look up towards heaven. And so therefore we are heavenly, but we have our feet firmly planted on the earth. We're spiritual, but we're also material. So he said, our, our task is to be the syndesmus and the gefira, the bond and bridge of God's creation. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail, for this quite interesting presentation. Ευχαριστούμε την καθηγήτρια Βολοσάκ για την εξαιρετική παρουσίασή τη και τα στοιχεία που ανέδειξε και την πλευρά που ανέδειξε για τη χρήση τη τεχνητή νοημοσύνη στην καθημερινότητα και, στην, και σε διάφορε επιμέρου τύχε τη επιστήμη. Νομίζω ότι τώρα μπορούμε να ανοίξουμε το διάλογο με το κοινό. Ε, μέχρι να πάρουμε κάποιες ερωτήσεις, θα ήθελα να εκμεταλλευτώ το ρόλο του στον νηστή και να θέσω ένα ερώτημα που μπορεί να, ίσως να, ακούγεται, να ακουστεί ενδεχομένω σε ένα βαθμό απλοϊκό. Αλλά το ερώτημα έχει να κάνει με το εξή. Στο βαθμό που η τεχνητή νοημοσύνη είτε έτσι τα γιος 
This artificial intelligence is a creation of human being. Do you believe that it can be start to develop independently for human beings when humans are the ones that give the material for artificial intelligence to develop? Do you believe that AI can fight against human beings? Artificial intelligence uh, does rather artificial intelligence has got a, some kind of freedom or could it have freedom uh, against human beings since it always depends on the data set and on the knowledge that is offered by human beings and it develops some kind of conscience. Uh, Dr. Tassis, you have the floor first. Artificial intelligence does operate independently up to a point, and we do not know how it processes the data that we give it. We do not know how it comes up with a conclusion that it gives back. And secondly, ask themselves, design it in order for itself to work in the most effective way by correcting its procedures and processes that we may not know. I wouldn't say that it is free, it has got freedom, because that would be something different. It is a different kind of intelligence compared to human intelligence, which can be harmful for us, for human beings. The idea would be for artificial intelligence to be a tool. However, I am not certain that this is the direction towards the forefathers of artificial intelligence are working towards. Its leaders want a general artificial intelligence and a super uh, artificial intelligence for them. Our AI is not a tool, is something different. And for some meta-humanists, artificial intelligence would be one, a new meta-human being that would be our successor, so to say. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Voloshak, you have the floor to answer to the question. Yeah, so I, I think Dr. Tassis said it very well. Um, I don't think, I, I think it's, I don't think we know the limits of artificial intelligence yet. Um, but the one point he made, which I really agree with, is that we need to put limits on it. So we need to know now that there could be possibilities of ex it expanding beyond uh, what we expect and to already begin legislation that would put regulations around it before we get to the point where it gets out of hand. Um, I don't think in its current form, it's likely to be dangerous, but it is evolving, evolving, evolving um, with, as people work with it. I, there are two kinds of people that work with AI. There are the people that develop it and the people that apply it. I apply it. But when I talk to the developers, they tell me that they believe it can be expanded. Uh, it, it may be expanded much beyond what, what currently exists. And that's, I think, where we need legislation. I would like to push towards a certain direction. A second question would be the following. Theologically speaking, since the establishment of artificial intelligence might be part of the creativity of human beings. Theologically speaking, that's, it starts as a creator and co-creator along with God. Why should we believe that some there are limits necessary when it comes from the, let's say, from the tendency of human beings to create, why should we pose limits? Who would be the person who uh, would place limits since we ourselves create artificial intelligence? And if artificial intelligence will be independent and autonomous, how can we be as the creators put the limits on it? 
I'm happy to answer that question because I have to deal with this every day. I mean, you know, Gail, if you would like to give the floor to first to to oh, oh, to, sure, sure. to, no give, to give the no to problem. give the order. That's that's all. Please, that's... please. Συγγνώμη, απάντησα εγώ πρώτος, επειδή απάντησα και εγώ πριν πρώτος, οπότε... I do apologize for taking the floor myself. I do apologize, Gail. Uh, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor Tassos. Sorry for that. So, so, to some extent, it's up to us as humans to keep, to monitor our our, our, the things that we create. Um, think about the atomic bomb. I mean, if we do not limit radiation chain reactions, we will kill ourselves. I think artificial intelligence fits in that same domain. We must limit what we create. As good creators, that's part of our job. As I said in the beginning, radiation is great. It cures cancer, but let it go out of hand and it causes cancer. We need to, we need to protect what we create. Ναι, η, η ανθρώπινη δημιουργία πρέπει so, να οριοθετηθεί. Οι human creations should be limited by human themselves. Την αρχαιολινική παράδοση του μέτρου. It is uh, all about the uh, self-limitation of human beings by recognizing the limits whose limit and exact point we could not know beforehand. And Finding those limits, identifying those limits is about prudency, wisdom. Wisdom includes uh, common sense, experience, fantasy, and without prudency, without being prudent, we cannot self limit ourselves, and without self limitation, apart from our self destruction or apart from losing our freedom, uh, a democratic ethos is not possible. A democratic morale, without that, citizens could not experience and reach and fight for democracy if we do not have prudence, if we do not have that ability of self limitation. Especially in the case of technoscience, artificial intelligence and technoscience in general, this is uh, a sine qua non condition because our discussion today is about artificial intelligence, another parallel risk that is not as widely known because the developments are not so known, is the human upgrade, this whole issue of human upgrade. Artificial intelligence will be used for the human upgrade. We do have the first brain uh, implants from human leg, and this is a field where uh, a regulatory framework should be imposed and we ourselves should put um, self-limitations any kind of intervention in the human body that is more than restoring our health should not be allowed, in my opinion. I hope that this should be discussed in public uh, sphere before the developments are uh, so quick as the ones in artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. There is a question by Professor Paula Ducher from Canada. I don't know if we could give him the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, Paul, okay. go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gail and, and Professor. Um, I do have one question in the sort of danger area for artificial intelligence, and this is the military application of artificial intelligence. I have seen some suggestions, for example, that Israel may be using artificial intelligence for uh, autonomous weapon systems uh, in Gaza, just to give a, an example. Uh, it's very fine for us to uh, sit around and, and, and moralize uh, about this sort of thing, but if you have unscrupulous governments, of which there are more than one in the world uh, today, uh, Russia, China, that would see the application of artificial intelligence precisely for autonomous weapon systems and with the, the rise um, uh, of, of uh, uh, particularly drones uh, equipped with artificial intelligence, uh, we're into a completely different ballpark. I, I know it's it's for us, I said, we can sit around and moralize about these things, but practically speaking, uh, what, what can be done? Where are we likely to be going? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. 
So that was your professor mm. Tassis first. Kitaxte. Look, historically speaking, there are examples of self-limitation in the development of um, mass destruction weapons. We do not use uh, biological weapons. We do not uh, make chemical war. We have achieved that, so to say. So artificial intelligence is a more difficult case because for the time being, AI is not a weapon of mass destruction. AI can be used as a software in drones, can be used for uh, attacking the infrastructure, the grid, uh, etc. Can be used as a means to stop telecommunications, but for the time being, it's not a weapon of mass destruction. Therefore, uh, artificial intelligence will be used for as long as the effects of its use will not be evident. And it, only if uh, its effect will be evident, we will start to limit it. Until then, AI will be used in wars and war operations. And I do hope that the conventions for its limitation will be uh, entered into before uh, drones, before using drones that have AI software, because there is a huge issue here. Some people may say that it is better to send robots of the war and not kill our soldiers. However, the other countries that would not have AI robots would keep sending in the war human beings. Therefore, we would have a nightmare scenario where embodied artificial intelligence could kill human beings on uh, the war. And before something like that would happen, it would be a good thing if we would enter into international conventions for the limitation of the AI in war operations, at least to discuss the, uh, let's say, the approved uses. So I, I, I agree with Paul's uh, comments. I think that there are a lot of concerns about military applications. Um, we know for, for sure that the military is using AI and machine learning for cybersecurity, for facial recognition now, for trying to uh, map uh, locations of different uh, of movements, which are based on predictions, not just based on what, what movements people are making. Um, I don't, I personally don't know the extent to which uh, the military is using AI. One of the worries that was brought to my attention a few years ago was um, not, it was a human augmentation. So um, people that can't, it, so it wasn't AI, it, but it was, a, it, it was one of those things that we put artificially into people's brains to help them move the computer screen. So you have, you have an implant that's put in the brain of a person that can't handle, can't move, and you allow that the brain to move a cursor on the computer screen. Well, there was the suggestion that the military might be able to use this as a great tool because they could fire bombs more rapidly just by thinking about it instead of by actually having to click on a mouse uh, to do it. Um, that was an application that was discussed. I don't know whatever happened to it. It would not surprise me if there are some AI applications that are currently ongoing. And um, I do know that US uh, military are uh, restricted in how they can use um, certain types of technologies, but I don't even know what the process for that restriction looks like. Foreign governments, I would have no clue how that could be done. I do agree with Professor Tassis, though, that we've had a lot of mass destruction technologies that have been around for a while, and um, so far uh, we've been able to deter the general population. I would hope that we could do that still, but AI is a little more insidious than a nuclear bomb is. Thank you, Gail. One more uh, intervention from Theophilus Abatidis. Could we give 
Uh, Theophilus, the floor, please. To ask this question. And then one more question. Theophilus, yes, you have the floor. I would like to thank first of all the two speakers. I would like to say that I'm not an expert because, and I may do some mistake to what I'm going to say. So I'm not an expert. I will start by this disclaimer. First of all, in my opinion, as well as in every important social or philosophical issue, we have the two sides, the optimists and the pessimists. It is very difficult to look upon the issue uh, having a more, let's say, uh, cool approach. What concerns me is that apart from the fact that we should not be technophobic, since we all understand that until that point, artificial intelligence is helping human beings with lots of applications, I am concerned by the opinion of the experts and the goal setting of the experts, if you wish, or some philosophers that uh, talk in favor of that. Target singularity. And I'm talking about singularity with a sort of perspective or approach, if you wish, that has got metaphysical dimensions. I think that Dr. Tassis is mentioning something like that for his book on human upgrade. Therefore, there is an announced effort, a declared effort, if you wish, of only a few people today that could have million or billion of dollars, know-how and experts that could work towards this direction. Now, if one were to think that Nordstrom or Ray Korshut uh, define singularity, it is rather worrying. Moreover, by understanding the Fukuyama of Habermas, who believe that the development of AI, and let us say here that they believe it, and they, ta they take it into consideration along human upgrade, meaning that I cannot um, separate human upgrade from AI. I think that those things go hand in hand. They see a threat for democracy and human rights. I'm not sure if some kind of moral or self limitation or ethics is solution enough. Fukuyama seeks, even in Christian idea of uh, God or in Kant, a base of ethics, but the ethics is not something unique, or, and we cannot all agree on a minimum of ethics. And last but not least, my last remark is the fact that that declares the perspective for the end of human beings, or if you wish, for a, an obligatory application of AI and the singularity. So through this geopolitical competition of large states and big powers, it is difficult to say that, yes, I will not go down that road. Because if the other state does that, they will be much more powerful than me. So within this concept, the concern, the grievous concern would be, which is, what is human after all? And what is that will save that human beings us theologians, however, tend to say that this is uh, because we are created uh, in the same image as God and likeness as God. However, I am very concerned with the evolution of nanotechnology and the ethnophonics 
and Habermans believes that this is the largest threat of the 21st century. I'm not certain what would save the human character of human beings. That would be, let's say, the uh, solution to that problem. Thank you very much. Dr. Tassis, I would like to say a clarifying question because you mentioned something about my book. I'm not sure that I understood your reference to my book, said Dr. Tassis. In my opinion, I said that in your book, there are some notes, if memory serves me right, and you link other books, and you say that, for example, Nordstrom has been has said that they have metaphysic efforts, they have a kind of spirituality, of religious spirituality. There are the technical meta-humanists and the superhumanists. The technical meta-humanists and the transhumanists. The first have as a goal the creation of the unique of the singularity of a metabiological species, a super intelligence that and that would be able to populate the universe. The transhumanists say to the divination of God through its radical upgrade. So the technological meta-humanists see the human upgrade as a tool towards singularity. However, the end goal is the uh, super smart artificial intelligence. France humanists want to use artificial intelligence only as a tool for their own divination. So the concern of people as Harari is if a super artificial intelligence will come earlier before their upgrade. And they say that in order to avoid this scenario of a subjugation of human beings to artificial intelligence, we should upgrade ourselves in order to face this challenge. This is what Harari is saying. Now, to your question on how we could protect our humanity, our human character, on how we could base such an ethics, we cannot agree on a philosophical level. Philosophers, we don't agree, we don't have this tendency. Such as the uh, every philosopher who works on ethics haven't agreed until now. The same will happen with the artificial intelligence. In, as far as I am concerned, the humanity is a positive part of human nature. We have our empathy. We have fantasy as human beings. We seek what is beautiful, what is truth, or what is just. Those are characteristics of our human humanity, of our human character. And those, for me, it is worth uh, defending them. And our form today as embodied uh, living creatures is valuable for us. I don't agree that there is a better human being, a better form of human being that can be achieved through our technical upgrade, so to say, because the formulation is that uh, allows us to believe that those people are objects. Uh, maybe a 
mobile phone, a mobile device can be upgraded because it serves a purpose. And we believe that if we will improve this characteristic, we give it a better RAM, we give it a better signal, that the machine will be upgraded, that the mobile device will be better. But what is a better human being? And why this better human being will be able to achieve with the use of technology that just would maximize their skills, meaning that this train of thought is childish, in my opinion. Human being is an object with specific uh, uh, attributes. Those are uh, specific, and we can upgrade it and become better. On the other hand, the people who believe the singularity, they are anti-humanists, because for them, human species is a means to achieve a goal. They do not fear define the fact that they are human themselves. For example, records fine. So, in my opinion, defending humanity in our form is something that a burden, if you wish, that is for all democratic citizens to bear, and how we are going to do that, we can discuss it, if you wish. But it would be much more important to agree and to try to defend it. Personally, the Church of Praise and Theologians invite me more to seminars in compared to philosophers, and this showcases that despite the fact that we come from different beginnings, it seems that we have the same goal, to defend our human nature. And that makes me optimistic. Thank you very much. Gail, now you have the floor. Uh, yeah, I think for Professor Kutas has said it very well. Um, the only thing I'll add in is that sometimes there's a fine line between what it is to be improving hum humanity and what it is to go too far. That example I used before about implanting a, a device into the human brain to allow one to move a cursor. Well, in a person that's paralyzed, that, that tool changes their disability into an ability. Um, there are other things that we have done that, like for instance, drugs that help people be able to concentrate better um, when they have concentration problems. Those are technologies too. Um, so if we're so so it seems to me that if we're using them for people that are have deficits, it's got one purpose. But if we're using them to improve people that do not have deficits, then we're trying to make superior human beings and that then it becomes dangerous so it's that same issue about technology it's how you choose to use it that becomes um important um for the transhumanist uh agenda there certainly is a lot of movement or discussion about um taking human thoughts and putting them in a box so that you can now have a machine brain instead of a human brain um i think a lot of this is science fiction. I, I, we have not yet put one thought into one computer stick. Um, I think it is very far off, and I'm not sure the purpose is valuable. I mean, the, as Professor Tassi said, we are human beings. We have certain features. We have certain functions. Why do we want to be something that we're not? So I think that those were all valid points. Thank you, Gail. Μια τελευταία ερώτηση από το κοινό έχουμε, η οποία είναι... Our last question from the audience. I will read it in Greek. By Mr. Hiotis, how can we say, God, that the so-called three laws of robotics by Asimov will always be integrated in AI applications? And which is the institution that could be impose those laws? Dr. Tassi, look, I'm not sure if those three laws of robotics are enough to safeguard that AI will be safe and positive. 
let's say that I ask artificial intelligence to make everything that makes people, uh, human beings, happy. And it starts uh, changing people's faces with plastic surgery and makes everyone the same, so to say. This was the easiest way to make them happy for that application. And so, uh, the laws are respected. All the example, if we ask artificial intelligence application to improve the um, production of gifts, and it tries to improve uh, the clips, the paper clips, and that is everything is good, it consumes more and more computing power. So it starts to use the grids, the factories, the plants, it puts down houses, demolishes houses in order to resolve that problem. And at the point, only the planet is only a computer without human beings, and its only goal is to improve the production of paper clips. So artificial intelligence is not what we uh, see in uh, sci-fi movies and it has intentions or bad intentions and it hates human beings and wants to um, rule over humanity. The, pro the concern is the unpredictable effects of its use. The problem is that we cannot predict exactly what is going to happen during the interpretation of our own order by the artificial intelligence application. And this is why somehow our values should be included in its operation to align its operation with human values. And this problem is very difficult to be resolved. We haven't, we have started discussing it, but right now research focuses on the faster development uh, and evolution of artificial intelligence and not the alignment of AI with our human values. We don't know where we should start for in order to align AI with our values. One might say that let's give it uh, to read all the ethics theories of the philosophers and everything will go well. However, this is not the case because our theories, each and one of us has weaknesses and a lot of uh, theories are incompatible with each other. Therefore, even if we would uh, teach all those theories to AI, it doesn't mean that um, it could um, do something better, something more than us philosophers do. So we should create a new ethics theory. But if we could have that ethics theory, that theory would not be for human beings because we should have uh, experience of the human nature. One should have a bodily function. How can one be moral without empathy, without um, having a body without uh, uh, having prudency. Even Spock in Enterprise did have a body, and he recognized that the lack of emotions um, is not on his benefit, and this is why later on Spock is uh, having humor and uh, emotion. And, however, even Data, who is a robot, has a support to find some kind of humanity which is unattainable to it, despite the fact that it is super intelligent uh, compared to human beings. Thank you, Gail. Yeah. yeah. Um, so first of all, I think we have to give Asimov credit for re thinking about what AI was back in the 1960s. He wrote The Three Laws of Robotics way back before we even knew what robots were going to be able to do. So I think that's pretty amazing uh, that he had that foresight, good science fiction author. Um, I do think that some of the legal, and, and let me just say also the people have written the fourth and fifth laws since. One is that a robot shouldn't tick off a person unless it violates the other laws. And the fifth law is that a robot should know it's a robot. Um, so, so, so there are now five laws, but they're not all Asimov's laws. But I, I think that the kind of legislative approach that, uh, that Professor Tassis mentioned is exactly what would be helpful here. Um, this would force people to put into their AI approaches um, this kind of thinking about protection of humans. 
Um, so I, 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 I think that it's only going to be legislation that's going to help with that. Uh, AI is going to be legislated, I'm certain, in the future. So we'll see what happens. And I thank that uh, person for asking that question and reminding me of my Asimov days. Thank you, Gail. Κλείνοντας αυτή τη σημερινή συνάντηση, η οποία είχε δύο εξαιρετικές παρουσιάσεις. Uh, after those wonderful presentations by our distinguished speakers, I would like to thank you all for being here. I would like to thank our audience for being here. Um, the people of the Academy of Theological Studies for their contribution, as well as, of course, our interpreter that took part in this meeting. I would like to remind you one more thing that our next meeting for the Time for Action events and uh, it will take place within the framework of our collaboration with the Metropolis of France. The so-called liturgy after liturgy, it will take place on the 25th of April. Having as a guest speaker, Professor Paul Adoucher, who was here today, and we will talk about St. Maria Skestova of Paris as a, um, an example of the liturgy after liturgy. We would love to have you here with us. I would like to thank one more time the two distinguished speakers and to wish you all a good night. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.